degrees Celsius. Laura Foster, BBC News, Glasgow. Well, we can find out where we are with this draft with Rachel Kite, who is the dean of the Fletcher School at Tufts University. You've been a UK government climate change advisor and a member of the UN Security General's high level task force on climate change. Thanks for joining us from Glasgow. So first of all, have you been working through the night? Have you managed to get any sleep? And when can we expect the next uh, level of the next draft? No, I think uh, COP26 President uh, Alok Sharma, no drama, Sharma, um, put an announcement out last night that uh, new documents would be released after eight o'clock this morning. There'd be no plenaries through the night, allowing ongoing consultations to take place. So we would expect to see new documents uh, after eight o'clock this morning and then a plenary session where he can describe where he thinks the progress has reached and what he thinks is still um, for negotiation. Uh, he still is optimistic that we finish today, sort of later on Saturday, but I think it very much depends how much progress is in the new documents uh, from all sides. So I guess the next question is, what can we expect to stay within the new documents and what do you hope will stay within the new documents, within the new draft? So the big points of contention are that we're clearly not on track for a one and a half degree world, 1.5 to stay alive. And so the idea is that governments will come back in a year to show that we have got on track. But the language for that is not mandatory. It, it's a, it requests countries, which is strong language in the UN, but not enough when you think that we're in an emergency. But I think the real sticking blocks are around finance, which has always been the case coming in, and around loss and damage. The developing world does not want to leave Glasgow without real commitments that the rest of the world will be there to help them with the transition to adapt to climate change, and that there be a separate standalone facility that will help them with the loss and damage, that is the cost that they have borne, although they had nothing to do with the problem uh, from climate change. So what do you, what's your assessment of the appetite for loss and damage? Because some countries may argue, when, when do these kind of repatriations end? Yeah, so traditionally there has been really strong pushback from developed countries, in particular the United States, who don't want to get caught with a historic price tag for their profligacy with the use of fossil fuels up to now. But I think that given the state of the emergency, that position has to move a little bit. And the developing world is very much united in this demand. And there's a moral element to this as well. We're starting to see some countries and philanthropies put money on the table to try to kickstart the idea of a fund. We'll have to see whether any progress has been made overnight. And what about coal? Let's go through these issues uh, one by one. When it comes to coal, what do we need to look out for? Because, of course, there are negotiations and there are pushbacks when it comes to countries that are so coal, heavily coal reliant. Well, so as, as the, the film showed just before I came on, uh, first mention of fossil fuels, this was not, we were not able to explicitly mention fossil fuels in the Paris Agreement. So getting out of coal is the prerequisite that this is the most polluting of all of the fossil fuels. And the language there, I think, I don't think it gets any stronger. I think what we're fighting now is to not lose language, which suggests that fossil fuel subsidies have to be phased out. And there's some mealy mouthed language about inefficient subsidies. I mean, there is no efficient subsidy of fossil fuels at this point. They all have to go. And on the topic of subsidies, what about gas and oil subsidies? Well, here we've seen real progress while we've been in, in, in Glasgow with the beginning of a coalition to phase out financing and exploration of oil and gas. Now, interestingly, Wales has uh, joined that, but not Scotland or England. Uh, Ireland has joined as well. So you've got a, a small group of countries that are saying we're no longer going to be exploring any more oil and gas and we're not going to use public finance to finance it. So, but this is very much a vanguard group that does not have wide consensus yet. OK, well, Rachel, we'll wait in the next few hours when we get that draft. But for the time being, Rachel Keiter, climate advisor to the UK government, thank you so much for your time and thanks for uh, getting up early to be with us here on BBC World News.